Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to the Truth. It is a blessing and privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into another new week that wasn't promised that this message finds you blessed. It finds you growing. It finds you stronger in your faith than you've ever been in your life because this is the most amount of life you've ever had. Somebody needs to say something. You know, and I'm excited because we are, I want to just start out by simply saying happy resurrection day to you. Amen. Happy resurrection day. See, I, I've been struggling and studying with the word Easter. Because when I was growing up as a kid, Easter was referenced to the resurrection of Christ. This day and age, Easter, the Easter bunny, the Easter eggs, and so forth and so on, we're so far away from the resurrection that I'm lost and I'm dumber after hearing it. So you're going to hear resurrection from me because I don't I want you to know emphatically what I'm talking about and what we're celebrating on this beautiful day. Amen. Amen. Because, see, last week we touched on the Palm Sunday message. Who is this? Right. Do you know that most people didn't know a lot about Palm Sunday because we go right into Easter? Do you realize from the time he came into Jerusalem to the time he was crucified, there were six days and some things happened within those six days? We don't consider any of that because see, he had some work to finish before he finished his work. Come on now. Are y'all with me? So now I'm going to walk you through a little bit this morning of the six days. Just a little bit. Because so much changed. You remember coming into the experience, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now in the highest, right? They laying down their palm, the palm branches, laying their cloaks on the ground, letting them walk on them, ride through, they're lining the streets with throngs of people, crushing against each other, trying to get a sneak peek of this Jesus. That's how it started. Stay with me. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to John chapter 12, starting at the 12th verse. Say amen when you have it. If not, say wait on me. Amen. 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 And it reads this way. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Verse 14. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, verse 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. Verse 17, So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continue to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him, because they had heard that he had performed this sign. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hours come where your people gather themselves together once again to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power to fill me fresh in you with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer and will be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. This morning's sermon title is called, In Just Six Days. In Just Six Days. At the top of your outline, you will find the singular word, Hosanna. And it says, Hosanna was the triumphal shout by the crowds as Jesus entered Jerusalem a few days before his crucifixion. The expression means, save now. And so I just want to welcome you once again this morning and say happy resurrection day to you. And then I want to ask you once again to go back with me to Jesus' triumphant ride into Jerusalem. We want to reset the scene. There is excitement. There's palpitations. There's an energy in the air that is unmistakably great. And you hear the shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then you want to know why. 
Why all this excitement? Why all this electrifying buzz? Why is the city just dancing? And it's because the day that all the Jews have waited for, for all their life and all the prophets had prophesied about was at hand. The Messiah of Israel was being revealed. For over, I mean, 600, 700 years they've been prophesying about this Messiah that would come and the rumor hit the street. He was here. Israel's new king was coming and he's going to set them free and put them back on top of the world. All their suffering was going to be over. This is what they are expecting. This is what the excitement is about. They believed Jesus was the real deal and that they would finally have peace and rest. And the reason why they believed he was the real deal was because many of them had seen and heard of the miracles. And that the things that he was doing and did all fulfilled the prophecies that had been written about the Messiah. So, and here's the deal. Many so-called Messiahs had become before Jesus. Mm -hmm. But none of them could fulfill the prophecies or had Jesus' power. So they were looking at the evidence. This one right here, he's real. He's the real deal. Right? Mm -hmm. And man has always questioned whether the Bible is the inspired word of God. That's true. And God gave us two supreme proofs to validate that the Bible is his inspired word. The two proofs of this, prophecies and miracles. Those are the proofs. So let me break it down to you. Prophecy spoke of things to come long before they actually materialized. Many of the things that were prophesied about Jesus was spoken of him some 600 years or more before his birth. Amen? Amen. Moses, Isaiah, Zechariah, even Malachi, just to name a few, all prophesied about the Messiah to come. And Jesus was fulfilling all of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. He checked every box, didn't miss one. And to prove his being sent by God was the evidence of miracles. Are y'all getting this? Yes, sir. See, realize that when he did the miracles, they were not done in the dark. They weren't done and hidden. They were done in public for the world to see. One of the first ones that really seemed, kind of lifted and elevated all of this. So you would think that when he took the, the five loaves and the two fishes and fed 5,000, that'd be the excellent, the ultimate miracle, right? But it wasn't. You thought when he gave sight to the blind that that would be the ultimate miracle, right? Like when he spit on the ground and he made clay out of it and rubbed it on his eyes and told him to go wash his face over there and come back and he could see. You would think that would be enough of a miracle, but it wasn't. Here was the ultimate miracle. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he had been in the day three days in the grave, three days. And they say by now he stinketh. Mm -hmm. I love it when they say it. That's that old King James version for you, by the way. By now he stinketh. And he simply says these words, roll the stone away. See, this is the deal. It was the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead that brought many of the people to Bethany. They had heard of this. They knew that Lazarus was dead, 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 dead. <laughs> that even his sister says to him, by now, Jesus, he stinketh. John chapter 12, verse 9 to 10 says this. The large crowd of Jews then learned that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. That's scripture. You know how we are. We want to see for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. See, John paints a very interesting picture of the people's reception of Jesus' interest in the Jerusalem. In verse 12 uh, and 13, he reveals to us that the people prepared for Jesus' entrance. This is what they did. It says, on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So the large crowd of people that had come, historically, they believed that there was about two million Jews that showed up for the feast, for the Passover at this time. Two million. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. The people had come to observe a ceremony. Here's the issue. There are people today who still just come to serve, to observe the ceremonies. And nothing more. They were not looking to change. They were not looking for healing. They weren't looking for salvation. They, went, they just came to observe the ceremonies. And so, but can you imagine that they came to celebrate the Passover and they find out that this Jesus is walking among them? 
John in verse 13a goes on to tell us the people prepared to honor Jesus. It says they took the branches of the palm trees. I love that. See, it was when they heard that Jesus was coming that they made preparations to receive him. So here's the deal. They heard of the miracles first. That's what moved them. Not just him coming, but because he came and now so that he was working miracles. The palm branches equaled honor. It was if this was their national symbol and they were waving their national flag to Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, save now. Hosanna in the highest. You get this? I'm just trying to set the scene because this is what he's coming into. It's in verse 13b I'm talking about in just six days, y'all. It's in verse 13b that they didn't stop there. It shares that they went to meet him. It says, and, and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They went out. Y'all get this? They acted. They moved. They didn't wait on him to show up. They went to go see for themselves, right? And they went forth to meet Jesus and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so Hosanna means save now, right? If it's translated right, okay? They wanted Jesus to give them the victory now. They even went as far as to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Do y'all get what they're saying? They called him the blessed king of Israel. So they're, they're putting him in his rightful place. It's just a, there's a problem with that. In all this praise, and all this ceremony, the people had their own image of who Jesus was and what he was going to do for them. Somebody need to say something. See, they had crafted in their mind what Jesus was going to be for them. Amen. That's us. That's us. That's us. We want to dictate how Jesus is going to be our Jesus, how he's going to be our savior, how he's going to deliver us, how he's going to give us grace, how he's going to give us mercy, how he... We want to dictate those things because we've all read the scriptures and said how we're supposed to live. Just somehow we never make it there. But it's OK. God knows my heart. Mm. That's me. Come on. Come on. Tell the truth. Shame the devil today, baby. But you see, they paid no attention to how Jesus came into Jerusalem. Now, they're sitting there looking at verifying that he is fulfilling all of the Masonic prophecies about the Messiah. They're verifying that he's checking all the boxes. So you can't say you didn't see the evidence of how he was coming. You just chose to not acknowledge it. Because you want what you want. When you want it. And so it's in verses 14 and 15. Jesus is trying. Look at his triumphant motorcade. Listen how he come in. Jesus finding a young donkey sat on it. As it is written, verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. Christ came into Jerusalem as the humbled one. Humbled. He rode on a small donkey and in doing so fulfilled prophecy. Another prophecy checkbox, right? He didn't come in on a war horse, but on a donkey, a donkey's coat at that. Do you realize the donkey's entrance was an entrance of peace? Somebody to say something. This spoke volumes to who Jesus was in his mission. See, it's not until Revelation that we see Jesus, the warrior king. Revelation 19, verse 11 and 12 describes what the warrior king looks like. It says, and I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, my Lord. And in and in righteousness, he judges and rages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and his name. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. That's in the end when he comes back. Verse 15 is taken from Zechariah 9, 9, where the prophet shares, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humbled and mounted on a donkey, even a, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. It is in humbleness Christ offered himself to the nation. Are y'all getting this? In humbleness. He is the king of peace. He came 
in peace. But you see, it's in, I'm talking about in just six days this morning, y'all. In verse 16, the scripture captures that even his disciples were confused by Jesus' entrance on a donkey. Listen to what it says. These things his disciples did not understand at first, at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, that means that when he was resurrected and ascended back into heaven, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. You see, all that the disciples had been with Jesus and had never done and nor requested anything like this. They'd been with him all this time. He had never asked or done anything or expected any special treatment. Everywhere they went, they walked. But now he requested a donkey and it's colt. But it wasn't until Jesus' resurrection that they would remember that these things were written of him. Do you get it? Even those closest to him wasn't seeing the truth. Because they only wanted their version of truth. In this day and age, you will hear people say, well, I got to speak my truth. But here's the issue with your truth. It is not the truth. Huh? The truth is the same thing. The truth has always been the truth, not my truth or a truth. It is the truth. But we always want to say, well, my truth is let me speak my truth. Your truth is based on what? There you go. Come on. Come on. I'm going to you, let you carry this message today. <laughs> it's, good, it's good, good stuff. But you see, it's in John. Verses 17 and 18 shares with us the reason why the people ran out to meet Jesus. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. Verse 18, for this reason also the people went, to, went and met him because they had heard that he had performed this sign. They ran out to meet Jesus because they had seen and or heard about the miracle. They didn't come for salvation. They didn't come from deliverance of sin. They didn't come to get peace with God and the peace of God. They wanted the miracle. Are you getting it? Our motives is always special. Even the Pharisees shared they couldn't talk that. Verse 19 says, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. The Pharisees are arguing amongst themselves, saying all the stuff that we've been trying to do ain't done no good. Look, they didn't left us and went to him. Mm -hmm. okay. Crying in their beer. That's crazy. The Pharisee's statement about the world has gone after him was just speaking about the masses of the Jews at the moment. And I find this illustration to be true. Stay with me. Don't stone me yet. Do something spectacular and the world follows you. No questions asked. Do something spectacular and the world follows you. See, the world wants a leader and people want to be led. But the true question is, will their faithfulness last? Somebody needs to say something. Because, see, it is shortly after Jesus' triumphant ride in Jerusalem that the chance of in praises of Hosanna, Hosanna starts to die. It was on the same day Matthew shares. Jesus entered the temple and cleansed it. This is Matthew 21, verses 12 to 13. It says, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers in the seats of those who sold doves. Verse 13 and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. This is during the week before his crucifixion. This is day one. He rolls into the temple. That is house. Are y'all getting this? Listen to what he says. It is written, my house. Come on. That's a key word. I hope y'all underline that in your Bibles. My house shall be called a house of prayer. He didn't say God's house. 
He didn't say father's house. My house. But you have made it all a den of thieves. So he's claiming you're in my home doing things that my home was never meant to accept. I'm just trying to help y'all understand. And, it's, and I love this part in verse 14. This blessed me tremendously. Verse 14, Matthew 21. After he cleanses the temple, it says, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. And he healed them all. Verse 15. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Verse 16. And said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfect praise. Somebody needs to say something. Do you realize that the, 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 the chief priest and the Pharisees and the scribes had no fear of God in them? Oh, yeah, yeah you got to get this. They're in his house questioning what he's doing in his house and nothing that he's doing is bad. It's all good. Mm -hmm. And when all the bad was happening, the chief priests and scribes said nothing. Mm, right. I just want you to see the world in the church. Mm. You see, this caused the Pharisees and the scribes to strongly desire to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. But you gotta ask yourself the question, why Lazarus? Why Lazarus? He's a proof. Because Lazarus was proof of Jesus' power of being sent by God. Now listen to that statement. Lazarus was proof of Jesus being sent by God, and yet you're plotting to kill the man God has sent. I'm just trying to help you understand because, see, they couldn't be in touch with God and be this way. Because there should be a huge fear in your heart to touch anything or anyone God has brought on. Amen? Amen. But y'all don't, they don't, I'm just trying to help you understand to see that when you want what you want, you will do what you need to do to get what you want. Yes, sir. These are the folks who was reading the scriptures every day, mm -hmm. teaching it to the people. I'm just trying to help you understand. These are the people that was in the temple that was teaching it to the people. Man, in just six days, y'all. Mm -hmm. John shares in John chapter 12, verses 10 to 11, these words. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death mm -hmm. also. Because on the count of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. So they're going to kill Lazarus because they have no ability to pull the people back. There's no new lie they can offer them that's going to bring the attention to them back. But they got to get rid of Jesus and Lazarus. So the people were looking for a military redeemer. All the folks along the road, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna now. They're looking for a military redeemer. Someone that was going to conquer Rome and put Israel in control. The people's dream of this military redeemer started rapidly fading to the point that even one of Jesus' own disciples betrayed him. See, I'm talking about in just six days. Matthew captures this betrayal in Matthew 26, verse 14 to 16. It says, and then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to, to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Can you imagine someone that then broke bread with you at your table? Taking money to have you killed? See, it don't even fit in your heart or your mind, does it? He, he was one of the inner 12. He walked with him. He talked with him. Also, he was also the money keeper. If you go back and look at the beginning of this John chapter, 
When it gets to this part, he was the one questioning when, 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 when Mary was, Magdalene was playing the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, scented oil perfume on his feet. He was the one having a problem with it because it cost 300 denarii. That was 300 days of labor. He was having an issue. He's the one who says we could have made some money off of this. Right. Not caring about that. I'm just trying to help you understand the people, the betrayals have always been there. They've always been there. And here's the thing. I'm talking about what a difference six days make. The attempted destruction. Here's the piece I want y'all to wrap y'all mind around. And I want you to understand this and look at it right now, even apply it to today. The attempted destruction of the church wasn't coming from the outside. It was coming from the inside. Somebody say something. When we do things in Jesus name that has nothing to do with Jesus, we are attempting to destroy the church from the inside. Amen. Everyone is looking for the destruction to come from the outside. You, you want to bring bl blame the gays or whoever else out there you want to blame and say that they're trying to strip the church of this, that and the other. They can't take any of those things from the church. Only the church can surrender that. Y'all getting this? So the destruction of the church, if anything, will come from within, not from without. Judas was no different from any of the other people who refused to see Jesus as the Savior from their sin. I guess what makes Judas look worse is that he knew better than anyone that Jesus was who he said he was. Y'all see that? He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt who Jesus was and still decided to betray him. He had seen the miracles. He had heard the prayers. He had seen lives changed. First hand, not second, third, fifth hand, first hand. He had seen him walk on water. I'm just trying to help you understand. He had not just anecdotal information. He had experimental information and evidence. But when you want what you want, you do whatever you have to to try to get what you think you need. His betrayal was because Jesus was not the type of Messiah Judas wanted either. He wanted a political Messiah. Judas wanted to be somebody. Do you realize being a disciple was one of the greatest somebodies you could be? But he wanted a title. Some property. A few shekels. So you betrayed the savior of the world? See, this betrayal by Judas took place before the Passover meal. I'm just putting everything in chronological order for you so you understand that in these six days, all of this had to happen. A lot of ugly happened in a short period of time to bring the death about of Jesus. How do you fall so far out of favor with everyone in six days? And Jesus revealed at the Passover meal that he knew of this betrayal and by whom, and yet Judas did not confess. Can you imagine being right there in front of the person that you're getting ready to betray? And he's saying, I know you about to do this. But you don't even go, Lord, I'm sorry. Because here's the other thing he knew about Jesus. He was forgiving. He was forgiving. Restorative. Grace and mercy and love. He knew all these things. Let me let the scripture help you out. John chapter 13, verse 21, 28 says, And when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. Verse 23. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. 
Verse 24. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. 25. He leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom and said to him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26. Jesus then answered that it is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Verse 27, which I have marked in all my Bible is the most horrific scripture ever known to exist in a man's life. And it says, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Do y'all get that? Ask yourself the question, how can someone who has been walking with Jesus for three years plus, right, be a perfect vessel for Satan to enter? He was never real. That's why the church is in trouble. So many people are in there looking like they real and they not. My God. Just trying to help you understand. Then it says this, therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. He looked him in his eyes. What you do, do it quickly. Go get it done. And it was at this Passover meal that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. The communion that we share, it was there. Same week. In six days. So much, right? Matthew shares in Matthew 26, verse 26, 29, these words. He says, and while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. This is all in those six days, y'all. This was given to them and to us to do in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. Somebody say something. Do you find that it's kind of a funny, funny, not a funny ha ha, but listen to this. Very similar as to why they were celebrating the Passover. It was in remembrance of God watching over them as the death angel passed by when they were in Egypt. Very similar, right? And so after the Passover meal and the communion, Jesus and his disciples went to the Mount of Olives and they sung a hymn. Y'all know that, right? Scripture shares in Matthew 26, verse 36, that Jesus and his disciples crossed the Kidron River and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was also during this time that Jesus went to pray to the Father about the road set before him. Matthew 26, 39 says this. And when he went a little beyond them and fell on his face, I love this, and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Do you know why I love this passage of scripture right here? This was Jesus getting ready to die for the sins of the world. And you see his humanness. He goes, he has his little, the 12, and then he takes a smaller version of the inner circle with him. And he goes a little bit, few feet beyond that point to go pray. And it says, and he went a little bit beyond them and he fell on his face. He fell, he just dropped. And prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. See, the cup that Jesus was talking about was the cup of God's wrath. Jesus was taking on the sins of the world, and that meant God's entire wrath for those sins were going to be focused and punished on him. Jeremiah 25, 15 speaks of God, the cup of God's wrath this way. He says, for, the, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, take this cup of the wine of the wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to, to drink it. 
This is why John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, these words. And he, he being Jesus himself, is the propitiation. So some of you may not understand what the word propitiation means. Propitiation means that he satisfied God's wrath and covered our sins all at the same time. For our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Jesus prayed three times that the Lord would take this cup from him. And each time he prayed, he shared, not my will be done, but your will. It says that he prayed so hard that fervently that sweats of blood dropped from him. Are you getting this? He's about to die for your sins and my sins, and he has no sins. This is why we celebrate the resurrection, because of what he did. It has nothing to do with the Easter bunny or even eggs. It has to do with suffering. It has to do with death, hell, and the grave. Come on now. But it also has to do with resurrecting power. You see, and it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. He had just finished praying. He had just finished praying. And the opportunity presented itself. Judas took his word to the heart. I'm going to do it quickly, Lord. And Jesus was moved from judgment hall to judgment hall. See, I'm talking about in just six days. And when he finally was placed before Pontius Pilate, we hear the new chant of crucify him, crucify him. Mark chapter 15, verse 12 to 14 says this. Then answering again, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with, who, with him whom you call the king of the Jews? Verse 13, they shouted back, crucify him. But Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Do you realize it was some of the same voices who just a few days earlier were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now in the highest? The prophet Isaiah shared this. We're getting ready to close, y'all. The prophet Isaiah shared in Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6, these words, how our Lord and Savior would suffer for our sake and be crucified. He says he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of, for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. You see, Jesus endured the cross so that you and I would have a right to eternal life. Somebody needs to say something. They thought they were doing something when they crucified. Apparently, they didn't know all the scripture then. <laughs> because he said, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. Come on now. Apparently, they didn't read all the scripture. Because, see, they thought they were killing him. But he says these words, that I have the power to lay my life down. And if I have the power to lay it down, I also have the power to what? Pick it back up. You know how we can be. Jesus is scantily clad, almost to the point of naked. And they stretched him wide and hung him high. His mother is right there on the front row when they're doing all these horrible things to her baby. It was from the cross that he speaks to John and says, Mother, consider thy son. Son, consider thy mother. He was entrusting his mother into the care of John. 
He cared about mama on the cross. They killing him. In just six days. You see, here's the thing. They stretched him wide and to further humiliate him, they put him between two thieves. One on the left and one on the right. You see, you can't humiliate God. <laughs> I just want them to understand. They were trying to humiliate him and with his mother there, put him between two thieves. And even when the thieves were talking, one of them said, just remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Because he says, I'm guilty of this and so much more, but just remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And he puts death on hold. To save a soul. There is no humiliation in that. Only salvation. Are y'all getting this? Yes, sir. And as they continue to go through this process of crucifying my Jesus. They went as far. As to pierce him in the side. And it said, and the blood and the water came streaming down. Here's what I know to be true. Everything in the Old Testament has taught them this, that there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. So our perfect lamb. Do y'all realize the same day that Jesus was killed was the same day in which they slaughtered the Passover lamb? Same celebration they were celebrating. So our perfect lamb died on the same day. And here's the other part. They put him in a borrowed tomb. I've known people to borrow a lot of things. Money, cars, sugar, salt, <laughs> crackers, bread but I've never known a man to borrow a tomb and give it back. This is what I love about this story. They put him in a tomb, rolled a stone in front of it, had a seal put on it and put two guards out beside it. This is man trying to do his best to make a mockery of God. But I say, think I told my cousin earlier this week, our arms are too short to box with God. Do you realize that the grave couldn't hold him? That if you continue to read in scriptures that it says that he went into hell and he witnessed before all the demons that was already trapped there, not witness of salvation, witness of his conquering of death and hell and the grave. You can't hold me. You can't touch me. But thanks for playing. <laughs> I'm sharing this with you because I want you to understand the importance of why we celebrate Easter, the resurrection day, because all this happened in just six days. Because we love the passage of scripture where it says just about the break of day. The earth shook and the stone rolled away. We also love that translation or, the, or that perspective of scripture where it says, and the angel was sitting on the stone. Chillaxin. Mm -hmm. You see, I want you to know that before the stone rolled away, our Jesus was already gone. Mm -hmm. You see, the stone rolled away so that you and I could be the Mary Magdalene's and the Marys and so forth to come running in and the Peters and all of them to see, come and see where he laid. Grave clothes still there. Come and see the faith cloth that they had put on the face. It was still there, folded nicely. It was still there. But my Jesus wasn't. In just six days, my Lord, you see, my Savior and your Savior got up out the grave with all power, heaven and earth, in his hand. 
He died in my place as well as yours. Jesus still is the only way by which man can be saved. And salvation is free. He paid the price to all who would ask. Paul shares this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Somebody should say something. And as I close this morning, my prayer is this, that you don't become deceived by the world, but that you keep your faith and focus on the one true God and never, never, never let your chant of Hosanna, Hosanna die. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for another beautiful time in your word, Master. I pray that all that was shared here this morning was acceptable in thy sight. God, I thank you for these that pressed our way to be a part of this experience this morning. I pray for those online as well. God, I pray that we would take this word and teach it to our children the true meaning of Easter. And even to those adults that don't know, let's teach the true meaning of Easter and resurrection and why it is so important. And how it changes lives. For without the truth of this message, Lord, your people will continue to perish for a lack of knowledge and truth. Father, I thank you in advance, even right now, for what you are about to do in this country. Amen. And so, Father, even now, if we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place but never your sight, God, I pray that you would go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace until we should come together again. And Master, we ask these blessings in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Like and share. Drop a comment. Take care. Be good.